looks like we are on lecture M. Is it Mary? Is that correct? Yeah. I think it is. All righty. So we're going to write two loops, one not being a nested loop and one being a nested loop, and just figure out their performance. So that first loop we had. We needed a variable to hold what we were counting. That, that would be hard for you to, to follow along then. So we're going to call this function test1, right? So int test1. Why am I making it return an int? Because I'm actually going to return that variable that ticks 1 for every instruction that's executed. And it needs to take a parameter variable named in so that we can call it with various amounts. All right. So we need to declare a sum so that we can start adding to it. Let's have our while loop. While n is greater than 0. Now, I'm going to set this up in a very specific way that I don't normally do. Normally, I don't put the opening brace on the same line as the while, but just bear with me. This, just this one time, I'm going to. So I'm going to add n to the sum, so sum plus equals n, and I'm going to subtract 1 from n. That's the formula that we're curious about. So all of these are moments of importance, right? These are the key parts of the formula. The variable that I'm going to declare now is just to measure. So I'm not going to worry about its time to be created. But let's just call it t, right? t is equal to 0, not minus 0. t is equal to 0. And for every statement we have here, let's increment t by 1 because it takes one bit of time to declare our variable. It takes one bit of time to have a for loop, excuse me, a while loop, get back. It takes one bit of time. It's arguing with me so much about the placement of these things. To add to the sum, and it takes one bit of time. Oh, you. All right, I give up. I'm putting the brace down there. But I'm still tabbing that out, whether you like it or not. OK. And then t++ for the subtraction of n. And then we can return t, right? So we're just testing the performance of this loop, how many instructions it's executing for n. Well, let's write a for loop that calls this function, and we can print out a cute little table. To print out our cute little table, we're going to use IO manipulators. So let's come up here and do pound sign include IO manip. Pound sign include less than IO manip greater than. All right. So inside a main, we want a for loop. Four parentheses int n equals 0, semicolon, n is less than or equal to 10. That ought to be an interesting, you know, series of numbers to play with from 0 to 10. n plus plus, because the summation of 0 is 0, and the summation of 10, I believe, is 55. But that's not really what we're going to be looking for, because it's not returning the calculation n. Instead, it's returning our little time calculator. But it'll be see if it comes anywhere close to those values anyways. Okay, so let's get 
our t for calling the test1 function. So int t is equal to test1, passing in in. So we're passing the in argument in to fill this parameter variable here. And let's print them out. C out less than, and if you remember, to set the width of something, you use set w. So set w, and the width, let's set it to three spaces. Even though it's only going to go up to 10, let's set it to three spaces, or n. And then this number, I'm not sure how big it's going to get. It's not going to be that large, but I'm going to set its width to 5. I'm doing this just so that it will be in nice little columns. So set w parentheses 5 followed by that piece of data, which is t. Remember, you have to call set w once for each piece of data you're formatting. So that's why I put it twice in here, not to mention that I was setting them to different values. And then less and less than ENDL. Let's run it and see what it does. All right, there we go. The first time we called the function, we passed in zero. It didn't do anything, right? It didn't go into the loop at all. All it did is initialize the sum variable. Didn't do anything else, so we only executed one instruction. When we came in with n with a value of one, it did that once, and then it repeated the loop. I thought we decided that the loop had to happen three times. Yeah, it does. That statement got executed, that statement got executed, and that statement got executed. So three statements happen for every value of n. And we see that reflected here. So how about two? This happens just once, but these three statements happen twice because n was two. So it repeated that twice. So we could decide pretty effectively that this was three n plus one in terms of performance. And if there was a faster way of doing it, maybe we could write it a couple different ways and try to get that down to something. I'm not sure if we'd be able to. In terms of uh, analysis, this is what's known as a linear because it's directly related. You pass in 1,000, it's going to be related to 1,000. So if you graphed it, it would be a straight line. Let's look at our output again. 1, 4, 7, 10, 13, 16. You see it's going up by 3 every single time. That's a straight line. Let's write a recursive function, not a recursive function. Let's write one with a nested loop now. It's going to have an inner loop. It's going to be counting something else. So let's just copy test one and rename it test two to save ourselves a whole bunch of typing. And what are we going to do here? We're just going to add a little while loop that prints out the number of asterisks for n. So n starts off at 10, it's going to print 10 asterisks, and then 9, and then 8, and then 7, and 6, and 5, and 4, and 3, and 2, and 1. But let's use a for loop for that, just because I like to reinforce for you the idea of for loops. So we're going to need a counter variable to count the number of asterisks. I like x and i and stuff like that. So for parentheses, int x equals 0 semicolon. Or let's start out off at 1, like 1 asterisk 2 asterisk 3, whatever. x is less than or equal to n semicolon. x plus plus. And let's see, uh, we better use our curly braces. C out, less than, less than, quote, an asterisk end quote semicolon and then by the time we're done we need to see out one more thing to go to the next line see out less than less than ndl so we've added a whole bunch of things that get done in a for loop the initialization only happens once just like the sum got initialized only once however the comparison and the x plus plus happen twice so we're going to have to increase our two our t counter two times 
but just once for x. So why, how are we going to put that in here? I guess I'm just going to say t plus plus there, right, to indicate the initialization. Maybe I'll even put a comment, initialize x. And then here I'm going to put t plus equals 2, semicolon, and that's for the comparison and increase of x. Each asterisk we print out costs something, so t plus plus. And then printing out the carriage return costs something, so t plus plus. This is a considerably more expensive algorithm in terms of processing time. Not even mentioning the fact that printing to screen is about the slowest thing you can do. Really slows your program down to print to the screen. But even ignoring that fact, let's just run with what we have here and measure its performance. So we should have had one called test one. Let's call this test two. And if you didn't keep test one, if you didn't keep a copy of test one, if you just renamed it, I mean, if you made all your changes to test one, that's OK, as long as you have the idea. But it'd be cool if you had both test one and test two. So if that is the number for test one, let's also get the number for test two. I'm not sure what to call it if this was t, so why not call it t1, right? And then int t2 is equal to test2 for n. I better pause and help in a minute. And so here when we set the, I'm going to almost wind up rewriting this entirely, just so I, I don't confuse myself. C out less than, less than, set w, parentheses 3, in parentheses, less than, less than, n, semicolon. That prints out the first column, and then C out less than, less than, set W parentheses 5, in parentheses, less than, less than T1, semicolon, that prints out the second column. C out less than, less than, set W parentheses 5, in parentheses, less than, less than T2. Right, that prints out the third column, and then let's just print out an end of line. And yes, we could have done all that in one line. But looking at it was starting to make my eyes cross. If you feel like doing it all in one line, go for it. All right, so when it runs, all righty, these asterisks are totally messing our output up. Let's comment out the actual prints. That's going to speed it up, of course, because it's not going to count that, and it's not going to count that. The only reason I'm doing that is because it was totally messing up our output. And, eh. But you see what was happening. It was, if it passed in 7, it printed 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We have a nested loop. So this loop repeated itself once for every number being added. You are adding 10. It did 10 of them. It did 9 of them. It did 8 of them. It did 7 of them, and so on. Okay, so to try to speed it up so that it didn't garble our output, I commented out that asterisk. I commented out that ENDL. Hopefully our output looks good now. All right. For zero, they're the same. Why is that? Because if it's zero, it doesn't even go into the loop, right? It only enters the loop if n is greater than zero. For one, it took a little bit more than it did the last time because of the nested loop. It had to do a couple extra things, right? It had to initialize x, and it had to compare x. And so that's three more. For two, it went into the loop, and it iterated twice. So it had one extra for that initialize x. And then it had two extra for being in the loop, but the inner loop iterated twice. So that's really a total of four extra. So this one would be not only as expensive as that, but it would be four extra. And, and I'm not going to try to figure it out, but this is an exponential thing, right? It's getting larger and larger at an exponential rate. And if we graphed it, you know, it would have a curve going up higher. Right? At first, it looks like we could figure out the difference between 1 and 7 is 6. 
between 7 and 15 is 8, between 15 and 25 is 10, between 25 and 37 is 12. We could figure out the rate at which it's increasing, and that probably tells us something about the equation that does this. And I don't know how. Somebody showed me in a series, see if I could figure it out. Series calculator, where you type in certain values. I don't know if this is going to work. No way. I'm not that good at math. Forget it. Okay. I think I think we've proven a point. Yeah. What if we wanted to save this table to disk? It's so awesome. I'm so proud of it that I want to email my mom. I want to show her this table. We're going to modify our code to save it to disk. So we're going to use file IO. And it's always botches for at least one person. And if you're using a Mac, it's considerably different because if you're using Xcode, I don't know where it saves its files. So you would have to specify the full path, if you know what that means, meaning your hard drive name and your folder name and all that. But for the Windows folks, this is going to work. And even if you're using the Mac, for now, code it this way, and then you can research how to create a full file path for it. So we need to use a file stream. A file stream is just like C out and CIN, except it reads from a file or writes to a file instead of reading from keyboard and writing to the screen. So we have to add an include. Pound sign include F stream for file stream. There's two kinds of files. Well, two kinds of streams. There's OF stream for output, and there's IF stream for input. And before we go down and mess with main and it's all cluttered and stuff, why don't we just define a, a, a silly little function here that writes to a file? We might wind up in cutting and pasting this later or something like that. So I'm going to write a function called test write, right? Because it's going to write to a file. Let's declare a string that has a file name. String file name is equal to, and I'm just going to call this lecture m output.txt. Let's open that file. We need an OF stream object. So OF stream. Now since console input and output is C out and CIN, I'm just going to name my file F out so that everywhere I would have used C out in the past, I use F out instead. So OS stream F out equals open parentheses. Don't think that's going to work. File name. And I botched that, so let me go and look at the actual slide for it. Oh, it's ofstream.open, excuse me. So, ofstream f out semicolon, f out dot open file name. Sorry, I slipped into Python there for a minute. There we go. And now to write to a file is as easy as this. Instead of c out, well, heck, let's do I'm writing to a file. Backslash in, end quote, semicolon. But let's send that same thing to the file. So f out, less than, less than. I'm writing to a file, exclamation mark, backslash end. And anytime you're done with a file, you immediately need to close it. I'm sure you've run into the situation where you're trying to open a file, and it says the file is in use by another application, right? Or you're trying to copy files from one directory to another, but it can't because something has that file open. So you always want to close a file as soon as you are done with it. So f out dot close. And let's go down to main and call test write. So down in main, I'm just going to put the first line is just going to be test write. 
By the way, that name's going to be hard for me to remember, so I'm going to change that to something much easier to remember, like um, Goog. No, 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 no. How about um, Fred.txt? That'll make it easy for me to find. I can just do a search, and Fred.txt ought to show up real fast. And I put .txt as the extension just so I can use Notepad to look at it. All right, so I'm going to scroll down here. And above my for loop, I'm going to call test write parentheses in parentheses semicolon. I'm just going to call my function. And I'm going to run it. And I'm going to try and go and find that file and see if it's got my message in it. There we go. Writing to a file. Awesome. Did it do it, though? Let's go and find it. Maybe Cortana can find it. Fred.txt. There it is. Where is it? It's in my projects lecture M, lecture M directory. So it actually looks like it might be in my source code directory. I'm not sure about that. So I'm going to right click on this. Well, I'm going to do this and say open file location and see where it saved it. And the thing about on the Mac is when I did it like that on the Mac the last time I tried it, I couldn't find it with the search function, so I don't know where it was putting the file. But anyways, look, right here, along with our CPP file, it created Fred.txt. And if I double click on it, there's our output. Cool deal. Let's save our table to a file. So these lines right here, let's just copy that whole thing, but let's make a comment that dis displays the table on screen. And that this saves the table to a file. Save the table to a file. So copy from there to there. And change all these C outs to F outs because we're going to create a file variable name that. Now, of course, it doesn't work yet because we don't have that file variable created, but we certainly can. Same way. Are we going to ask them for the file name or are we just going to hard code it? Eh, I don't want to have to type in something every single time I run this program, so we're going to hard code it. String space F name or file name equals barney.txt to make it easy to find. Let's create our file object. It's an OF stream, output file stream. OF stream space F out. It's my favorite name because to make it work I just have to change C out to F out. Semicolon. F out dot open parentheses file name in parentheses. Now realistically we ought to do a little bit of error checking because what if file name pointed to a drive that didn't exist, right? To the Z drive and my machine doesn't have a Z drive, right? So we we're, we're not doing good programming here but we're doing the start of programming. We've created our file and now all of these F outs will just go to that file just fine. As mentioned, always close your file as soon as you're done writing to it. Uh, so f out dot close. Now some people take that to mean that they need to put the close statement right here. No, that's bad because it would close it only after writing one line of the table. And so when it tried to write to the second line of the table, the file is no longer open, it would crash. So f out dot close goes there. All right, and this will only work if you're on Windows. You'd have to figure out how to do it if you're on another operating system. But let's use Notepad to actually open that file. And we're going to do that with the system call. So let's make a string that's going to hold our command. String CMD is equal to quote notepad.exe space followed by the file name. So space end quote plus file name semicolon. I'm sorry, which part did I? No, um, I, I mean, well, I guess I need to scroll down. I can't see the bottom of the screen. Oh, I'm so sorry. 
<laughs> there we go. Feel free to, if there's a monitor in front of you and no person in front of you, to twist the monitor to the side so you can see. But if there's a person in front of you, don't twist them. They wouldn't like that. All right, so we have a command here which will let us open it. And so let's call the system and do CMD, but unfortunately we can't pass a string in there. We have to pass in a character array. So we're going to have to do something we haven't seen before, which is CMD dot C underscore STR. That just gets the character string version of it. I need to see if, it's, if we have to put parentheses after it or not. I guess it'll tell us when it compiles. Build errors. Okay, parentheses after C underscore STR. So what's cool about this is that when we run it, it creates our report and it pops it open to Notepad so we get instant gratification. When you're tired of it, click close, click close, and we're done. I want to make sure that works for everybody who's trying to get it to work. You could read from a file just as easily as you can write to it, write from it, right? Now that we have this report, I know we have a file called barney.txt. We could try to open it. We could do something with it. I'm not sure exactly what, but it, what is the format of our file? It's just three numbers, right? We could read in three numbers in a row and add them up, right? Something like that. I don't feel like doing that right now. In my mind, writing out to the file is a little bit more important for this particular lecture than reading in from a file. But why don't we open this file for reading and just display its contents on screen? Yeah, sure, we've already got it up here, but let's pretend that we don't have it open, that we don't have that file. So down here underneath all that, Probably I'd better do it before we call Notepad because that call to Notepad is going to hang it up until we close the window. So let's open the file and display to the console. That's what we're going to do now. We're not going to use OF stream. We're going to use IF stream. IF stream, and since I called the other one F out, how about FIN instead of CIN? IF stream, FIN. FIN dot open parentheses the same file name in parentheses semicolon. There's more than one way to do this. I'm going to go and remind myself how they like to do it. The first thing you can do is check to see if the file exists or not. And we could have been doing this with the uh, OF file as well. The syntax is just like this. You could either call if and then use not in file, which looks pretty weird, or you can use the fail member function. Oh, let's do that, just, just to be different than what they're showing. So if, parentheses, fin dot fail in parentheses it failed and let's write that out <clears throat> see out lesson lesson quote could not open file space end quote lesson less than the file name lesson lesson endl and let's close the file Or I guess we don't even need to close it if we don't get that far, but it's not going to hurt it. So fin.close. Just to test this one part. Now, of course, the file does exist, so we're not going to see that message. 
So let's intentionally break it. We will delete this line. But let's intentionally break it by setting the file name something that does not exist. File name equals blah.txt, right? I'm going to delete that line in a minute. As soon as I see my error message pop up, I'm going to know that this check worked. And I'm going to delete that because I don't want it to fail. But it's always a good idea to put some error handling code in your program. There were build errors. That was not what I intended. Is it got parentheses? Yep. Okay, so where it said dot fail. Okay. Anyways, no, I don't want to make it. I did get an error message here. Could not open blah.txt. It just went ahead and randomly, recklessly went down here and did all this notepad business as well. So let's take this out so that doesn't happen. And let's read the file in line by line. I believe the PowerPoints show us two ways of doing that. Let's go see which way looks better to us. Or maybe we'll just implement the first one we spot. Nope, they're not showing it. They're only showing one way. So we're going to look up how to use get line. We've already used get line before. Is it as easy as doing this? Let's do else. The file is open. While true. Just keep reading until we hit the end of the file. fin dot get line parentheses we need a string to hold our data so in front of that line I'm going to declare a string to hold our data string data and this is failing let me go read how to call get line how many characters you want. Okay, fine. We want 256 characters. Now that's not going to fix it, I'm sure. Let's go back and look again. Hmm. Well, we may go back to if stream get line. Okay, so you can call get line and pass in which stream you're trying to do. Just like that. Let's give that a shot. So, get line, fin, comma, data. And I'm going to cry if that doesn't work. Oh, missing my semicolon from the line above. There we go. Now, this is going to eventually hit the end of the file. Let's write it out. So C out lesson lesson quote I just read colon space end quote lesson less than data lesson less than ENDL. Right? Just to see what we did. And it went into an infinite loop. Why? Because it hit the end of the file and we didn't check for that. So why don't we do this? Maybe this will fix it. If fin dot eof parentheses in parentheses break, we could probably even make that the true, the, the while statement, while not eof. But let's see if this fixes it before we start working on that. And that did, right? Here it printed it out. I just read and it printed out all the numbers. 
It also printed out a blank line here at the end, which I don't like. Let's see if we can handle that. How would we handle that? We would check the length of the line, and if the length of the line is zero, we don't want anything to do with it. So maybe we can do this. If data dot length, parentheses in parentheses, is equal to, z is greater than zero, we're going to print it out. It's not greater than zero, it's bad data. Maybe that will get rid of that blank line. And indeed it did. Okay, so we've written a loop. One more change I want to make to it. Why don't we put the while not, why don't we put the EOF check right here instead of the true? I mean, do you like break statements? I love break statements. I'm happy the way it is. But the book would show it more like this. If we did while not fin dot eof parentheses in parentheses. While we're not at the end of the file, do this stuff. All right, now that's reading it in line by line. Let's just read it in number by number. So let's not use get line. Let's just use fin arrow greater than greater than data, just like we were letting them type it in from the keyboard. So that's what's cool about output and input streams, is it looks like the stuff we already know. Okay, and you can see what it did over here. It printed out all the numbers, reading them in one by one. 011, 147, right? Those are the same numbers we see here. 011, 147, and so on. And whatever we wanted to do. Do we want to sum them all up? You know, yeah, sure, we could do that. We would just need to declare a variable called sum, and we would need to add our data to it. And we would probably want to make our data an int or a double and stuff like that. Why not? Let's do that. So above our while loop, let's create a variable called sum, double sum equals zero. Let's change string to a double so that, I mean, you know, we might want to go back and add points, you know, decimal points to our data. Oh, I don't know what that's going to do to this. Tell you what, punt, punt, punt. I'm undoing all those changes. We're just going to stop there. Okay. There is a different way of looping without using fin.eof, and it looks weird. Here's how the textbook shows. Whoops, that's not the textbook. Here's how the textbook shows. While, and then they put the input statement right then and there. And then they have the rest of their loop here. So if we were going to code it like that, here's what it would look like. But since we're not going to. I think I'm going to just put it as inside comments. While fin greater than greater than value, you know, something like that, sum plus equals value, something like that. And up here, sum, we would need to declare our sum variable set it equal to zero and we would need to declare our value variable and we don't need to set it to zero. That's all it would take to open up the file, read every value in it and add it to the sum. It's actually cleaner than doing it this way, right? The only reason I was doing it this way is to sh give you the idea that you can check for the end of file, but you can also do this. And to me, this looks weird, but maybe this looks awesome to you. Now, the more I look at it, the more awesome it looks to me as well, right? But that would not have worked with get line. I do not believe. Guess we could try it. Yeah, I don't want to go experimenting and making I'll change things and making it change things again and so on. So, that's the other way of looping on a file. It's just to put your arrow arrow expression right inside your while rather than check for end of file. It magically works. And what do I mean it magically works? This apparently is returning a non-zero value 
but if it ever fails, this expression right here becomes zero, which kicks it out of the while loop. Anybody need help clarifying syntax errors? system call actually doing? It's just using the command prompt that hides in the background of Windows. If you hit the Windows key W, Window W, uh, whatever the Windows key is on your computer, and that didn't work, so I'm going to do it over here instead, and type in CMD, you get into this thing. If you type in pause, you said press any key to continue. That's how we've been making our program pause all the time. If you type notepad, .exe followed by a file name, it opens Notepad. And so that's how we are opening our file. And the only reason I say it won't work on a Mac is because you don't have Notepad.exe on your Mac. You can probably figure out an application that would be able to work in that fashion. I just never have done the research. Same thing with Linux. So that's why you had to have the space there, right? Because if you typed in Notepad.exe, notepad.exe file name.txt, you see a problem, right? The command prompt can't work like that. It has to have two words in order to work rather than one. Like that. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. It doesn't work. Right, right. Right. It absolutely has to have the space there. Yeah, we don't have a spot for the last four marks that we did it. Really? Okay. And the video's not linked to either. Well, I'll fix that as well. Okay, so we've talked about while loops, we've talked about post test, we've talked about pretext, we've talked about for loops. In other words, we've done almost all of this stuff. You could leave off parts of the for loop if you want to. What do I mean by that? Here's how we did it previously. For int i is equal to 0, i is less than 100, i plus plus, and then we did something with i, right? Like that. Okay, 100 is too much. I'm going to make it go to 10. But you could leave this part out right here as long as you checked and had a condition in here that got you out of it. For int i is equal to 0, and then just put another semicolon there. Don't bother doing any checks. I plus plus. And then we're going to write I out. But before we write it out, we're going to check to see if it's no longer less than 10. If it's 10 or greater, we want to kick ourselves out of the loop. So if, parentheses, I is greater than, how about not I less than 10? in parentheses, break, right? If i is not less than 10, we're going to break out of the loop. That works just as well. Logically, it's the same thing. Even though the syntax and the code is different, it does the same thing. It prints, you know, the numbers, or does it?
I can't say that that worked worth a hoot. So let's change this one. Let's say if i is greater than or equal to 10, then break. I think that worked. I don't know what was wrong with my other one, but it print counted from 1 to 10, excuse me, 0 to 9 twice. OK, so we left that out. But what if you didn't feel like doing this part right here? What if that variable had already been defined for some reason? Like, I don't know, int x is equal to test 1 parentheses 5 in parentheses, right? Just because we already have that test function up there. And then 4 parentheses semicolon. We're not going to initialize x. x already has a good value. And keep running while x is greater than or equal to 0, semicolon, i++. plus plus. Or we could leave that part out if we wanted to. Or, excuse me, x minus minus. And I don't know, just print x out. But let's print out something a little bit more interesting, like x equals, end quote, less than, less than, just so. So C out, less than, less than, x equals, just so that our output is, doesn't look too similar, all too samey all the way through. All right. And there it did, right? It counted from whatever x was, that function returned 16. It counted down from 16 to 0. You can leave off any and all parts of it. You don't feel like updating it up here, you can update it down here. You don't feel like doing any of that stuff, you can. Four, right, like that. If parentheses x is greater than 10, in parentheses break, do something with it, see out x really equals in space less than less than x, less than less than ENDL, and then add one to x, like that. That works. The, <laughs> now that's the exact same thing as doing this. And so whenever I see, and I've seen instructors put it up, whenever I see instructors do that, it makes me kind of squint my eyes at them a little bit, because I'd rather see the word while wow, true than that. This looks a little bit funny to me. Looks like a crying face as an emoji or something. I don't know. Um, but anyways, you can leave off any part of it that you want, as long as you're doing it in the loop or before the loop starts. The only reason this worked is because x had a value, right? If I had never declared x before we got in here, if I referred to some variable that didn't exist, that'd be bad news. And I need to declare it either above it or right here, right? I need to put it there or somewhere above it if I want to get that to work. Keeping a running total. That's what I was just about to do with our file I.O. What is a running total? You just declare a sum variable, and you add to it inside the loop. You want to add the values of every number between 1 and 10, which from long experience, I just happen to know if that's 55. The summation of 10 is 55. Write a loop to do it, because I know it keeps you up late at night wondering that. So let's do it int parentheses, wait, 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 what am I doing? For parentheses, int num equals 0, semicolon, num less than or equal to 10. Why don't we start it off at 1? It makes no sense to add 0 to something. So num equals 1, num less than or equal to 10, semicolon, num plus plus. And inside the curly braces, let's add num to our sum. So sum plus equals num. Now, I don't have the sum variable yet, so that's not going to work. But I could, right? Double space sum equals 0. We better initialize it so we can add to it. And now we could print it out. C out less than quote, less than quote, summation of 10 is, end quote, less than, less than, sum, less than, less than, end deal, right? You declare your variable, then, and this is basic programming, which you did in fundamentals, if you ever took fundamentals or if you've ever taken another programming class. Very common concept. 
declare your accumulator above it, and inside the loop, you modify your accumulator. Wow, this program's starting to do a lot of things, and I'm getting tired of seeing Notepad pop up. I may comment that out. So the summation of 10 is really 55. Where is that opening Notepad? Down here at the bottom? Yeah. Enough of that. If you like it, leave it in there. What else can you use a loop for? For input validation. They need to type in a test score. It needs to be between 0 and 100. You're going to yell at them until they type in a score that's between 0 and 100. So double score equals 0 and then write a while loop. Or actually, initialize it to an invalid value. Like negative one, so that it'll enter the while loop correctly. While the score is less than zero, or, you know, shift to the bar, shift backslash, score is greater than 100, as long as those are true, one or the other is true, we're going to ask for the score, and if they type in an invalid value, we're going to yell at them. I so prefer to write this as a nested, excuse me, as a while true loop, but I'll do the way that the textbook probably shows us, which is asking beforehand, enter a score between one, 0 and 100. That actually makes 101 possible values. I don't know why they hit me. End quote semicolon, and then read that in to score, cin greater than, greater than score, and then while the score is less than 0 or greater than 100, we need to yell at them, C out less than, less than, we could inspect it, right, we could see if it's less than 0, say it's too low, if it's greater than 100, but we're just going to say number is out of range or invalid number, right? It's, it's nice to give them some clue, and I'm not sure that's enough. And then we need to ask them again. So I'm just going to copy those two statements right there and paste them. That's one way of doing data validation in a loop. And I'm going to show you my preferred way of doing it. You can pick which way you like better. It's just to use a while true loop, and if we get a good piece of data, break. So something like this. While parentheses true. Oh, and this is too low. Sorry, Randy. There you go. Okay. C out, less than, less than, enter a score, 0 to 100, colon, space, end quote, semicolon. CIN greater than, greater than, score, semicolon, and let's see if it's out of range. If, parentheses, score less than zero, or score greater than 100, it's a problem. Tell them so. C out less than, less than, error. <laughs> I don't feel like typing more than that. Okay, fine. Error, out of range. Else it's good data, right? Else break. Now I'm going to remove my braces because it's going to shorten the code, right? Which way do you like better? They do the same thing. I don't like this way because you have to ask for the data in two different places. You have to use a, what, the priming read there, and then later on you have to do the same read again, so you're copying and pasting code. Here you're only doing it once. What's different about it is that the condition is here, but down here the condition is here, right, in the middle of the loop. And most textbooks don't show going this way. I was so happy when I found the Python scripting uh, textbook that actually shows using while true loops when other textbooks seem to ignore the concept. This is the way my brain works, so I would do it like that. Anybody want to venture an opinion themselves as to which one they like? 
I know 99% of y'all aren't going to say anything, but which one looks better to you? <coughs> to be honest, the top one for me. You like the top one? Okay, yeah. that's totally legit. That's the computer science way. That's the way the textbooks it's teach. It's just so functional for me because I'm, I'm just worried that if I mess up on a law of truth statement, it's just going to end up in a... In an infinite loop. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Like I said, totally legit answer. That's the computer science way. That's the way the textbooks show you. So, yep. So that's a running total. Signal values. A signal value is just when you tell them to type in a number, and then you have them enter a special value which quits. I'm almost sure we've done this. So same business here. Let's ask them for the score. See out, and I'm getting more and more terse as we go, right? Score. Negative one will quit, or negative one to quit. Score, or negative one to quit, colon. Read it in, CIN greater than, greater than, score. And then while the score is not equal to negative one, that's the sentinel value. Just like a sentry, right? Sentry kicks you out if you don't have the proper ID. The sentry is going to kick us out of the loop if we type in that bad piece of data, that specific value, negative one. All right. To make use of this, why don't we go ahead and reset our sum variable equal to zero and add that score to it each time, just to be doing something with it, right? Sum equals zero, semicolon. If they give us a good score, well, no, we're not even checking for good scores. We're just checking to make sure it's not negative one. We should put a nested loop in here to check for the values, just like we did here, but I don't want to make this example more complicated. So sum plus equals score, and then copy those two statements and paste them and put them inside the braces, because you recognize it. Um, that's the uh, first loop that we did. Do we want to print out the running tally as we go, or do we want to wait until the bottom? Let's print it out as we go. C out less than less than sum so far equals end quote less than less than sum less than less than ENDL. See how it works. It's wanting too much user input now. It's going to become tedious to debug. Enter a score between 0 and 100. So if I botch it, I type in negative 9, it's going to yell at me, tell me it's out of range. So I'm going to give it some good data. Now we're in that second validation loop, the while true loop. Same business. If I type in something that's invalid, it's going to yell at me. So I'm going to give it a good value. Now the third one, score or negative 1 to quit. Now we're rocking 50. Our sum is 50 so far. 90, 140, 100, 240. Negative 1. Whoops, we're out of the loop. And that was intentional. That was our value that exited the loop. Whatever the century valid it, value is, it better not be valid data. Zero would not be a good century value because you really might be able to earn a zero, right? You strike out. You earned a zero on the exam. Whatever. If zero is an invalid value, sure. On our density problem, Right? You can make it repeat over and over and over until they chose, and one of y'all have already done this, chose you know, zero, right? It listed a menu of sizes or zero to quit, or maybe it was eight to quit, I forget which. But you know, it exited out if you type that in. So that's a century loop. There's several different ways of loop termination, and I don't think that this textbook discusses it in these exact terms loop termination. There's counter based loops. Well, they just can't, uh, end when the counter is up, right? So that's one way to terminate a loop is with a counter. The second is with user query. Like, do you wish to continue, right? Do you wish to continue Y in? 
And the third one is the Sentinel value. Right. Interscore or minus one to quit. Now the Sentinel value can be kind of subtle. In our reading, where we used FEOF, the Sentinel value was the uh, end of file, right? Or maybe we could have put a number in our file that meant that that was a signal value, but instead we just read to the end of the file, and when we got an error, uh, you know, um, when we ran out of data, that was our signal. So that would have been that example. Time to stop. Time to make some drop boxes. Did we get through this chapter? We got so close to being through this chapter. Deciding which loop to use. I've already done this. Use a for loop when you know where you're going to start, where you're going to end, an unknown series of data. Use a do loop when if you need it to always iterate at least once. Otherwise, you use a while loop. It's an indefinite loop that repeats until the condition becomes false. Now, true, you could actually write any for loop with a while loop and any while loop with a for loop. So, you know, the while loop can do anything, but if something's counting, use a for loop. Nested loops, that's the only thing we didn't get to that I wanted to get to. We even had an example of a nested loop in that uh, code testing thing, but we're, we're essentially done with this chapter except for the nested loop. So we will need to cover that on Tuesday. And it won't be on the exam because I don't like putting stuff in the week before. <laughs> But otherwise, yeah, otherwise I think we're pretty much done with the chapter. We're going to do it again, though, right, because we have to do file I.O. more than once. So what's your homework for file I.O. is just to take any other program that you've written and modify it to save its output to a file, right? Whatever it was, anything that printed something, modify it to save that also to a file. Worth making a comment. Homework. Take any previous homework, doesn't matter which one, and modify it to save data, save output to a file. It'd be cool if you popped it up in Notepad, right? Make it easy for me to grade, but whatever. All right, let's stop here. That's going to require some uh, bonus credit. Yeah, if you open it up in Notepad, if you do niceties, okay, let's put the options, the stuff that's cooler. What is cooler in for this would be prompt the user for a file name. And if people are doing this on a Mac and can't figure out how to launch the application, I can't really count them off. So you'll get full extra credit just for doing that, but it'd be also awesome to see you use Notepad to open the file once it's written to and closed. Right. Okay.